Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Kerry Wilkinson. Hi Kerry. Hello, hi. <laughs> so Kerry is the author of the Jessica Daniel crime series with the Silver Blackthorn YA series coming in 2014 and the first Jessica Daniel book reached number one on the whole of Amazon.co.uk and the series is currently on book number six, Thicker Than Water. So lots to talk about today Kerry. So first up tell us a bit more about you and your writing background. Um, well, I was a journalist for uh, about a decade after I graduated from university, um, which is what I always wanted to do, really, so I was a sports journalist, because um, I was no good at actual sports, so that's the best thing. Um, and then when I turned 30, I just kind of figured I should probably um, try to do something with my life that wasn't just going to an office every day, so I started writing, and um, uh, I looked into how to get published when I finished, and um, it was kind of the usual sense three chapters to an agent and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I don't know, I didn't fancy it. I kind of figured, um, it was actually quite a positive experience for me to write. And I figured if I spent months getting rejected, it would turn into a negative. So I never bothered. Um, uh, and so when I saw the self-published last button on Amazon, I just went for it. And then um, about two and a half years ago, <laughs> and I've not looked back since. Yeah, so you, you, you said there that, you know, you did self-publishing and then haven't looked back and it sounds as if you just loaded your book and then miraculously everything happened. Is, is that how it went? More or less. I mean, that's not that far from the truth. That's pretty much what happened. So I put it out in July 2011 and just kind of left it out there for the world to see. And then, um, I mean, it did really well really quickly. In about six weeks it was in the top 100 and then by the end of October 2011 it only been out for uh, so that's three months or so, and then it went to number one, and it stayed at number one more or less until Christmas last year. So, mm. so yeah, I, I didn't do an awful lot more than just simply upload it and let it go. Yeah, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But um, why don't you explain a little bit more about the Jessica Daniel series, um, and you know, what are the books like, and, and who's going to enjoy them? Um, so the, the crime series of books involve um, uh, a detective sergeant who's a female. Um, called Jessica, obviously, and um, she's got kind of like a group of friends around her, some of whom work at the police station, some don't, and so on. And um, I never, do, I, I never really wanted to write just a core crime book. It's not what I read for a start. Um, it's just not what, not my thing for whatever reason. And so I, I tend to write about a person who just happens to be a police officer, as opposed to just, as opposed to writing a crime book that involves somebody. And um, I mean, it kind of works. It seems to be why people come back to read the future books. It's, I kind of figured crime, it, it has a formula, and you get towards the end, there's a twist, and even if people don't know what that is, they know there's, they know to expect one. It's just the way it works, whether you're writing books or television or movies or whatever, but people know the game. There's nothing clever there. So you can come up with a really intelligent um, uh, twist at the end and so on, and, and people might think it's clever, but at the end they know it's coming. And so you can be as smart as you like, but if that's the only tool you've got, I kind of figured that there's thousands of crime books all doing pretty much the same thing out there and there's nothing to stand out. Um, so with mine, I mean, I'm not really interested in, in things as such, I'm interested in people. Hmm. And so um, when I write about Jessica, I write about her and I write about her life and um, her friends and her relationships and so on. And she just so happens to be a police officer. Um, and, and so I want people to get to the end and want to come back to read the next one and the next one and the next one because they're interested in her, not necessarily because they think the crimes are really well thought out or that kind of stuff. I mean, that's just, that's just a bonus, but I kind of think that's the bare minimum, really. And, um, mm. and certainly from what readers tell me and the emails I get and so on, and that's what people think as well. Mm, and that's fantastic. So you've got this character, but as you said, there is a bit of a... a, a, a a formula for crime novels, and you come up with these twists at the end. So, um, how but how do you come up with a twist? You know, do you have a process for actually thinking up these plots? Um, not necessarily. Sometimes, I mean, most most of the plots come from something small, which I've read, or almost entirely non-fiction. That you just read something in a newspaper, and um, it just tweaks your imagination. So you think, oh, I wonder what if this happened, or what if that happened, and and away you go, and that's and, and that's your plot. And you, sometimes you work backwards, and you have the end first. And sometimes you just maybe got an interesting scenario, and you see where it takes you, and so on. 
Um, but pretty much everything I've come up with has, has come from just little snippets of things that um, I've seen or things that I've read and, mm. and then just expand and you let your imagination go. Mm. And you said you don't necessarily read crime, so what do you read for pleasure? Um, well, a lot of non-fiction, so I read biographies and autobiographies and um, kind of science fiction stuff. Like I read Doctor Who books and I read comics. I read a lot of comics. Mm. Um, I read the news pretty much every day. Uh, just, I mean, kind of things I always have really, like non-fiction especially and then comics. Mm. So did you specifically pick crime because it would be more commercially viable? No, I mean, I didn't think about that. Even in the slightest, it was nothing to do with that. It was just the idea that I had. So I read it up. I could have had some mad idea about intergalactic crime investigating space penguins, and I'd have written that up. But I didn't. I just wrote up what I had. So it just happened to be crime. Mm. So of course, uh, we are, we're actually talking on Halloween um, as we as we're recording this, and I wanted to sort of ask you, you know, because one of the criticisms of crime novels is they go into this dark side and there's murders, and you know, w w why do you think we as writers and as humans, I guess, are obsessed with this dark side of humanity? Um, probably because it's so alien to most people. I mean, people, <laughs> generally speaking, people aren't going out murdering other people. Um, it's the same reason you play Call of Duty on the PlayStation or Grand Theft Auto on the play because you don't go out and you nick cars, you don't go out and run people over, you don't go out and shoot people, and so it's it's kind of a glimpse into a different world which isn't your world. Um, so I, I just, it's just escapism, really. And I think that's probably why people pick them up in terms of the genre. Mm. And why do you write uh, a woman? Um, it's just what came out. I mean, there's nothing in particular that I thought it would be easier to write a, a girl than a, a bloke. It, it just came out. Um, and the same with the, like, some of my fantasy young, young adult series, which is out next year. Again, it's about a girl. Mm. Um, it, it just came out. I don't really know how to explain it any better than that. It was just there. So that's what mm. I mean. That was the character that you cared about. But it's interesting because um, I've been asked about gender and I actually use my initials, J.F. Penn, as my thriller name so that people don't confuse me, you know, so that people don't assume, oh, she's a woman, she can't write this. Now, you get the opposite, don't you? Because Kerry can be a male or female name. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> not only have I had two national newspapers call me a her or a she, um, <laughs> probably, at least probably 20% of the reviews I get referred to me as a she or whatever, but... I don't really know what to do about that. I mean, in, in like the afterwards, it speaks very specifically about the things, about the fact that I'm male. So if people don't read it or whatever, then there's not a lot I can do. I mean, I don't mind. It's just as long as they enjoy the books and they're great. Yeah. And do you think gender is important in writing? Well, it depends who you are as a person. I mean, I, I, I personally don't because I think you can have as much in common with somebody from the opposite gender as you do from your own. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, Boys aren't necessarily interested in football, and girls aren't necessarily interested in ponies. It's, it depends on the individual. So I, I kind of figure out I can write about anyone really. And mm. If the readers get it, then great. Mm. No, that's fantastic. And and tell us a bit more about this YA series that you've got coming out. So um, after the self-publishing stuff had taken off, and um, I signed in a. a contract with Pam McMillan to do six Jessica books and I've just actually finished the sixth Jessica book writing it and I've gone on holiday um, last year in 2012 uh, and I was just kind of laying around thinking oh that's all my work done <laughs> which it was in many ways it was great uh, and then I just had an idea for um, for uh, like a young for, for what the book turned into it's called Reckoning it's part of the Silver Blackthorn trilogy as it's called um, and so even though I was on holiday, I just um, went back to my room and got a pad and I just started writing uh, longhand notes, like plot, plot lines and how things to work out and so on. And then I started writing it when I got home properly. And um, when I finished writing the first book, which is about 85,000 words or something like that, I sent it off to my agent who really liked it. Um, and because of the Jessica contract, um, Macmillan, Pam Macmillan get first dibs on anything I write, or at least they get to see it first. So he sent it to them and... Um, they get like a month's exclusivity um, as part of the contract and they bid for it within that month because they didn't want anyone else to read it. So, uh, so yeah, it worked out all right and um, yeah, I, quite, I like it, obviously I read it, it's the kind of thing I, I read and certainly the kind of thing I grew up reading. So mm. um, it's got 
uh, it's kind of it's set a little bit in the future, uh, dystopian world as they call it, which is a word which I've never used in my life until people started using it to me. <laughs> and um, so she's uh, 16 and um, she gets the call to go and work for her king. Uh, and it doesn't. It's not quite what she thought it was, and so it's um, it's her story. And it's written first person, which is unlike anything else I've written as well. So it's very very different than the crime stuff. Mm. Now I'm interested because I I've just written my fifth novel, which is actually a crime novel, but I'm um, rather than action adventure, which is what I have been writing, and I feel like I'm finally discovering my real voice. I wondered if if this is where you, you know, are you feeling that this YA series is more you than the crime series, for example? Um, I wouldn't say it's more me, it's just kind of a different side of me, because uh, although I don't read crime, like I said, they're not really crime books in, this, in the sense that they're about Jessica and her friends, and so that kind of allows me to get all the kind of mad humour out of my head and um, hopefully they're quite funny and that's what people say especially if they go on and on and I think I was quite self-censoring when I first started writing and I kind of thought we well, can't put that in a book because it's outrageous and now everything just goes in there's like no censoring at all it's like every any everything I think is funny ends up in them now and I think they're better books for it and um, so I, I, I wouldn't say it's kind of the real me it's just kind of a different side and they let me tell completely different stories and it and you write about kind of police procedurals and you write about police officers. There's, there's a lot of things you can't do because it's set in the real world. Uh, so it's not like that. Like if you hit a part of the plot that you're not sure about, a science fiction that's set in the future, you can make up a piece of technology that gets you around that problem. So um, it's just a kind of different discipline, really. Mm. And I think that self-censorship, that's kind of what I was getting at because I feel like suddenly I'm actually including the things that were in my head and I didn't want to write down before. So it's really great that you're you're doing that too because it sounds like it, it, this Silver Blackthorn could be like the comic, it could be a you know a graphic novel. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's very um, visual. And, I, and so I've been having these conversations with um, publishers about how to promote it and things like that. And, and the fact that it is very visual means that... You, you can have really incredible, cool posters if you choose to go that way and so on. So that's the kind of thing we've been talking about. And maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't, I don't know. But um, uh, you're absolutely right, they are very visual and it's very broken down into chapter, 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 which could, of course, lend itself to 22 pages of a comic, which is what I read. And in, in very many ways, that's what, how I think like books should be structured. And that you, you want people to get to the end of the chapter and you want them to think, well, what happens next? You don't want to give them too many points where they can put it down and get bored and forget what's going on and so on and so forth. So, um, I think the fact that I read a lot of comics is actually very beneficial to the way I structure a book and a novel and so on. Mm, yeah, absolutely, that's that's fantastic. Um, so I guess w one of my questions about this is, is are you going to have to do anything with your name or your brand because you've got kind of adult crime and then you've got YA? Of, of, is, is that come into play at all? No, I mean, they, they kind of asked if I wanted to change my name or chuck an initial in there and that. But I, I just kind of think readers are intelligent. They can tell by the cover, they can tell by the blurb. I don't think people are going to be confused into thinking it's a Jessica book. It looks totally different. Mm. And I think people are intelligent. So, I mean, I wrote it. I don't see why it shouldn't have my name on it. So. Yeah, no. I think that's great, and I think this is a change that's happening in the market where it doesn't really matter. Authors are embracing everything under one brand now. Yeah, um, and that, I mean, that's how it's, I mean, that's how it will be coming out, I'll have my name, and it just look different in terms mm. of the cover and so on, but they'll all be on my website and so on and so forth, not changing anything because it's a different genre, and it just, mm. I don't think it matters, I think people are intelligent enough to know the difference. Yeah, um, so coming back to publishing, I read that you have taken a 14 book deal, is that, is that, is that correct? Yeah, so um, that includes the original three Jessicas, which I'd self-published. So it's those three, plus in the end, another 11. So um, uh, the 14 is broken down to nine Jessica books, three silver Blackthorn books, um, a spin-off crime book from the Jessica series, which involves another character who, in, who began life in the Jessica series, and then um, a completely standalone crime novel, which is 14. And then I've got other stuff on the go, like I'm self-publishing um, in November, to, uh, so next month, like in two weeks mm. from today. And then um, 
I've got a few other ideas of little blobs and ends that I might self publish and so on, like just fingers and pies. Just, I just keep writing. So. <laughs> No, that's fantastic. Because when I read that, I was like 14. Gosh, does that mean you've just signed your life away for the next X number of years? They're all written. They're all written. (laughs) That's amazing. So what is your writing routine like? You know, how many words are you writing a day to have written so many? It partly depends on the day, but um, get up early, like six, half six, something like that, laptop on, get to work. I mean, if I'm in the mood and... Everything. Um, I mean, I don't get distracted. I think the problem a lot of people find is that they turn the laptop on and before they start writing, they've got the Twitter open and they're just, you know, before you know it, three hours have gone. Well, I didn't do that. I'm, I can just switch off and work. So if I sit down for a day, I can work for 12, 14 hours and, you know, might have a meal break in the meantime. And then uh, if things are going on, I can write about a thousand words an hour. So I don't know. I mean, I kind of. I worked as a production journalist for 10 years, which is all about subbing and editing and self-editing and so on. So, uh, I mean, I'm far better than I was two and a half years ago, definitely. But um, I don't get edited that much. You know, stuff will go off to my agent and to the publishers and they'll come back and apart from, you know, typos and bits and pieces and a few notes on structure and so, you know, I, I don't really get edited that heavily because it's already been done. That's what I was trained to do as a journalist. So, um, a lot of that a lot of that sorted before it ever gets anywhere, let alone sees, sees the light of day. So I write quickly and I kind of edit myself quite a lot. And, and so things get done quickly. So, yeah. That's great. So you really, you're basically going around writing fiction in the same way you were writing your, your journalism pieces, which is you, you write fast, I guess. and, and you Absolutely. I mean, so I worked on tabloid newspapers where you get perhaps a football match report eight minutes to ten deadlines at 10 you've got eight minutes to turn around 500 words so you get used to working quickly and you can't have an excuse and say oh well, i was too busy looking at twitter because that ain't how it works you know that's the job that's how i was trained to work that's how i spent years working and so you just get used to working quickly and reading quickly and typing quickly and thinking quickly mm. uh, and then i, th- I think you know so locked in which is the first book i wrote i'd probably write a bit differently now I'm a better writer, but as I've kind of got used to writing fiction and then you've got all my kind of skills, I suppose you could say, as a production journalist to put on top of that, it means I can, I can just work quickly. I, I just can, and it's just something I can do. Mm, and if, uh, I mean, I would love to learn t- to do that more. Would, would you say that timed writing would probably be the best way to increase, to get up to that kind of speed? How do you mean? Well, like, like if, if I wanted to try and work like you, I would set a timer for 20 minutes and try and do, like, 2,000 words in 20 minutes. Or like, like, try and do timed things. Because you talk there about, like, a deadline. Almost, you know, I have eight minutes to go. I've got to do it. You know, does that help you go faster? I suppose. I mean, that was obviously under the fear of, you know, being able to keep your job. And you have to work quickly and you have to be good. And so you just learn to be. You're like, that's... There's no way around it. And so um, I, I suppose if I know I've got 10 hours to sit down and write, I know I should be doing probably 8,000 words. And that even gives me a little bit of leeway to mark around. And so if I'm not hitting that, I know there's a problem, so I'll try and pick it up the next day. But I mean, I, I, I don't really set targets because I know how fast I should be working. But I, I suppose in your case that, yeah, I mean, if, if you know generally what your writing speed is, say you can do 500 words an hour or whatever, and you're trying to get quicker, I suppose your best way is to set yourself targets mm-hmm. to write quicker in a set period of time. And I, I, I mean, I genuinely think a lot of it is just not getting distracted. I think most people can write relatively quickly if you just sit down and write. The problem is that people have other things on the go. They've got Twitter on the go. They've got kids, wives, boyfriends, husbands, or whatever around the house. And so instead of just getting on and doing something, there's distractions everywhere. Whereas I just don't do that. I just get on and do what I'm supposed to be doing. I treat it like a job, basically. It's the same way as if I'm at work. If you're at work, you can't just sit there with Twitter on the go for three hours. You have to work. And so I've been working. I mean, I'm 30, I turned 33 on Monday. Um, I've been working really either full-time or part-time since I was 16 years old so I just treat it like a job the same as I've treated everything else like a job because mm. it is 
No, that's great. And do you plot beforehand? So before you sit down to write, you know what you're going to write today? Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's very much evolved. It's like at first, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't know what I was doing at first. I had a very, very loose outline. So like the outline for locked in was about a thousand words, 1300 words. Um, and I was filling in a lot of gaps where I went. But now the outlines, they're ridiculous really. So I've got a plot outline for what I'm going to write next. The outline is 16,000 words. Huh. That means that when I come to write it, all the thoughts have been put into it. There aren't any plot holes because I've already worked them out. There aren't any just kind of gaps or anything because I know what I'm doing. And so even though things might take, like you might start writing a character and suddenly they stick in your head a bit and you think, well, this needs to be beefed up a little bit. And perhaps when you get to it, you, you might reorder stuff, which is what happened with that last thing I was writing. And I kind of totally re reworked the final eight chapters. And it was more or less what my plan was, but in a slightly different order. Mm. But at the same time, I still know exactly what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm never, I, I never get stuck. I've never had writer's block. I never sit down and I think, what happens next? Because I've already worked that out long before I've sat down to write. So, mm. again, I mean, again, that kind of feeds into the speed thing and I'm not ever sat for half an hour looking at a screen thinking what happens next because I already know. Mm. And I think that is, that's probably the number one tip I think people talk about is knowing what you're going to write before you sit down. So, and, and when you do that plotting process, is that a very different amount of time? So obviously you're not going to write the outline in the speed that you normally uh, write. Do you, how many uh, days does that take or do you have a process for that? I mean, it depends. So I wrote a book called um, Down Among the Dead Men, which is going to be published by Macmillan probably in 2015 actually. We've had to really work a few things just because we've got so much coming out. Um, but that was very strange. And so I was, I was driving home from work and I was coming out of the car park and I went over the final bump. And it was almost as if the idea dropped into my head over that final bump. And by the time I got home, I knew what I was doing. And that was on a Friday. So over the course of Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, I sketched out the entire thing, started writing it on the Monday and then finished it kind of two and a half weeks later. And so the whole process from no idea to complete the book was about three weeks. And then we sold it to the publishers about eight days later. So within a whole month, it had gone from a blank page to being sold to a publisher. But that's, that doesn't happen all the time. Usually I'm plotting kind of two, three things at a time, and it might take three weeks, a month, five weeks, you know, whatever. But I won't be sitting down doing it every day. It will just be um, kind of when I've got the time and... and I mean, I quite like that process because it's very um, unstructured. So I might decide where I'm going to sit down today, I'm going to plot, and I'll start working my way through and so on. And then other days I'll just you know, I might go out and do something or whatever, and then something will pop into my head while I'm out, and then I'll work that into it when I get home. Um, so it, it, it really depends. It can be anything from a weekend, which is ex like it, the literal meaning of extraordinary. Um, it doesn't really happen like that through to usually anything between maybe four, five, six weeks. And then I'll plot two, three books at the same time within that four, five, six weeks. And I mean, that helps me plot entire arcs. So especially with Jessica, I'm not just thinking of what happens in this book. I'm thinking of what happens to her over the course of the next one, two, three, four books. Now I need to know where she's going. And then that way you can lay a little bit of groundwork in whatever you're working on next and, um, kind of foreshadow stuff and so on and set things up. I, know, I mean, I never get to a book, uh, I never get to write a book and think, oh, I, I wish I'd changed this in something I wrote hmm. a year ago because I've already plotted in, enough ahead that I know where it's going. Hmm. But presumably you didn't do that with with the, with Locked In. So no, do, do you ever feel like you want to rewrite that? As you say, you've also become a better uh, writer. I mean, I'd, I'd make it a lot looser and funnier. And um, I think... Kind of the asides which I now chuck into the books, just when things pop into my head that I think are funny and um, perhaps the observations that the character might make, which are what the readers can then um, associate themselves with and so on and so forth. Like I never did any of that in Locked In because I just, I think I felt I had to be more structured. I had to make it feel like a book book as opposed to something that I might write. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I kind of knew now if I could go back and work with that it would just be a significantly better book than it is but I don't know you, you kind of just have to live with what's there and, and people still enjoy it I get emails all the time from people who pick it up and, and like the storyline it's just me that it pisses off and other people can, can 
kind of tend to think it's all right. So, yeah. yeah, no, I've read it. It's a, it's a really good book. So, you know, people can, but can people start anywhere? Because you're obviously at number six is the latest one. Yeah, and um, I mean, very much, I mean, I try to write them that they're all kind of standalone and so on. I mean, of course, there's allusions to things that have gone in the past, especially with Jessica and her friends and so on and so forth and, and you have little storylines and arcs really I mean again to you a comic book film you, you have arcs that, that build and, and they take three or four books to actually get to the point of the story and so on and, and so long term readers will realise that this has been four books in the making but if you're just a new reader you can still enjoy it and read it and get, and get it mm. it's just you won't get the context of it so mm. now I mean people pick up um it, from from any number and then kind of go back and so on. Mm. I was at a library event on Monday and people had started at book four and book five and so on they were asking and it, it's fine, yeah, you can get it you can get on from anywhere. Mm. No, that's that's brilliant. And then just a question on how you actually learned how to do this. Do you have any recommended resources for le- people who want to learn how to write a novel? Because obviously you came from non fiction writing into writing a novel. But you learn that from reading. Like if, if you read a book, especially if it's a half decent book, if, if you read pretty much any book, you can figure out the structure. I mean, read a crime book and you'll know how it works in that something happens in the first chapter or second chapter and in the final chapter or the final two chapters there'll be some sort of twist. There's, there, there's a format to it and if, if you can read it, it's like reading a news article in that you kind of reach the conclusion and then you go back from the start again. That, that's how a news article works. And if you can read it and figure out the structure, then, then you can do it. And that's all I was doing when I started writing, in that I was kind of reading books and, and trying to copy the structure of them. Yeah, so it's more like analysing what has worked for other people and then, you know, using that as a model, I guess. I suppose so. And then you break out and do your own thing within that. Um, mm. uh, and I mean, uh, and that... <laughs> I mean, the, the structure is relatively rigid in, in, in how things work, but people work within that and they might have flashbacks or flash forwards or they might do some chapters from a different character's point of view, that, that kind of thing. I mean, it's not completely rigid in that every book is the same, but there is a, a general structure that people stick to because that's just the, the way they're done. So if you're looking for a starting point, just read. Mm. No, that that's great. Now I want to ask you back on publishing. So you're obviously you're now, I guess, what we're calling a hybrid author, someone who has traditional and who is self-publishing. What is your feeling about you know the publishing world right now, and and whether people should be doing indie or or going traditional? Um, I mean, I don't I don't worry about it that much. I just get on and write <laughs> and send stuff off now to what is now my agent but what two years ago would have been self-publishing I mean I, I don't spend that much time worrying about it but I suppose if, if you're a new author I, I, I don't see why you wouldn't self-publish I mean it, if you're absolutely desperate to go with a publishing company then the, you can go the traditional route sending out to agents and at least it's easier now you can go via email which you couldn't do five years ago and so on and so forth but um just write you know, and if, if you're writing for yourself then just getting just finishing it means you've won and you've done what you set out to do I think if you're thinking oh, I'm writing because I want to make loads of money then you'll probably fail at what you're trying to do mm. um, if you're writing for yourself then enjoy it self-publish and hope for the best yeah and you I mean you didn't go seeking an agent or a publisher right it came to you <laughs> yeah it's, um, I've, I've still kept them. I've got about 26, 27 e- emails from agents who said, um, would you want to go out for coffee? Would you, um, you know, can we call you? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've still got them all. And then when we went down to London one day, my well, after I got an agent, she took me down to meet a bunch of publishers and we went around all these really nice glass fronted buildings. Uh, and you can see where the money goes. And, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we met a bunch of publishers and a few offers and then um, lots of overseas publishers as well. I mean, I'm publishing about 10, 12 languages now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, everything came to me. Yeah, and, and how did you decide, if you got all of these emails from all these agents, how did you decide which one to go with? Well, I mean, I wasn't that impressed with many of them, to be perfect. I was quite a few, I, I'd been in, like, national newspapers because um, 
had done well and was top of the charts and so on. And it was clear that about ninety percent of them had never written, a, had never read a word I'd written. Mm. So I just thought, well, in that case, they're obviously only interested in the money, so I don't really care. So I just ignored all them, kept the emails, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, but the my actual agent, who um, was called Nicola, she's great. She read the book. And she wasn't just like gushing and saying it's the greatest thing I've ever read because obviously that's rubbish. Mm. She just kind of said the bit she liked, said the bit she didn't like, and and that's all I wanted really. Just somebody who was honest with me, and um, so that it it was a natural choice. That there wasn't a lot of agonising over who to pick. It was the person who I, who I liked, and mm. was that. And and then uh, with the publishers, obviously you've you've got your deal allows you to self publish at the same time. Yeah, well, but partly because they've got so many books off me, they can't quite fit them all into the schedule anyway. So I've had um, three books out this year through them. I've got three books out through them next year. So it's not as if we can keep giving them stuff and say, do you want to publish this as well? Because there's nowhere to fit it into a schedule. So if I want to write other things away from Jessica and away from her world and so on, apart from going to other publishers who would then have the same problem as to when do we publish this. Self-publishing gives me kind of A, a window to get it out and B, a kind of a little bit of freedom to try new things with it and so on. Hmm. So you will content- continue doing both? You'll continue self-publishing? I think so. I mean, I don't see why not. So self-publishing then in, in two weeks, I suppose we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, if it's a complete disaster, then maybe I'll rethink it, but if things kind of go okay and and so on, I, I don't see why I wouldn't. I mean, I quite I quite like the hybrid model, and, and I think they kind of feed each other. So, yeah. um, so for instance, there's a lot of traditional marketing around the Jessica books, especially around the northwest of England, which is done by Macmillan. They do amazing jobs with the posters up and um, kind of rotating banners and all that kind of stuff. And and so people who found me in that way mm. might then be interested in self-published stuff because it's got my name on it. And then of course there's the other side in that. Amazon uh, stuff will be self-published through Amazon, and, and so you'll get into the mailing lists. And people who previously bought your stuff might well want to buy it because they they see it on an Amazon email and so on. And then if it gets in the charts, people who've never heard of you might see it and give it a go. And then if they like it, they might give Jessica a go. And I think they just feed each other. I don't really see any downsides to it. No, I don't. Obviously, I don't either. And it, that, it's absolutely brilliant what's happened for you. And obviously, success is not easily replicated. And everybody would love to be number one. Um, and you said you didn't really do anything. But, but for example, did you? Presumably, you chose a specific category, and you you had a low price as well. At least those. Yeah, things. I mean, I, I always knew I was going to write more than just that because a lot of ideas I stuck my pad. And once I started, kind of once Jessica started in my head, I. I just knew what to do more with it. So I always knew there was going to be a book two and a book three and so on and so forth. So I figured um, I, I just wanted people to read book one. I wasn't that bothered about money or making money from it because I had a good job. That paid me well. Like it wasn't an issue. But I figured if, if I made book one kind of a pound, if I made it cheap enough that people could just give it a go, mm. then I could charge more for books two and books three and so on and hopefully they would come back. And that And that is exactly what happened in that. Um, and, and they did that, and um, so I mean, I'm not trying to boast, but um, my third book, which I charged three pounds for, obviously with Amazon seventy percent, I made quite a lot of money off that. But that was off the back of selling the first book for a pound, and, and I, I kind of wasn't fussed about doing that. Mm. Um, and then yeah, I mean, I did buy a Kindle and thought about how would I find my book if I'd never heard of it, and so I just had a bit of a play. Um, and then the, as you're exactly right things like picking the right categories and all that kind of stuff and I think it gets overlooked quite easily and people mm. don't realise how important it is so I, I mean I made an effort to get the technical things right mm. to write a good summary and, and so on and so forth um, I just didn't really worry about social networks or anything like that mm. and to a large degree I still don't no, that's really good. I think exactly what you say is, is correct. I mean, I, the 99p price doesn't isn't so um, good these days, I think, because all the publishers are doing it, aren't they? Notice for Halloween, there's a whole load of pound books available. <laughs> and there's a lot of um, price matching. So, you know, Sainsbury's or Nook or somebody will do, like, a whole bunch of 99p books. And then um, 
Kindle price matching down to that. So yeah, I mean, publishers are kind of caught on to it. Mm. But I mean, in all honesty, if, if you can self-publish a series of, of books and you put book one at 99p and they've already got, say, 10 books from an author, I, I don't know why they wouldn't put book one at 99p. Mm. Well, who loses? I mean, they, they're obviously already making money from it. And if you snare someone with book one and you can sell them books two to two to ten for a high price, then it kind of works for everyone. I mean, it's the same kind of marketing that other industries have been doing for years. Mm. I think perhaps it's just taken the book industry a little while to catch on to it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, almost final question. How has all of this changed your life in the last couple of years? Um, well, so I left my job, which I love. <laughs> I left that in June, which is was that July, August, September, about three, four months ago, and so on. Um, which I kind of, I mean, like financially, it's not a problem, but I kind of still miss it just because I like the job mm. and so on. So um, I left my job in journalism, and I'm now a full time writer, <laughs> um, which involves just sitting on my sofa and not doing very much. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's you know made a bit of money, gave up my job live at home, work at home, etc, etc. So, I mean, it's, it's changed everything. Basically. I've gone from working in an office and getting up and going to work every day to getting up and walking down the stairs. It's, um, it's not the longest journey. But, um, yeah, it's, it's changed my entire life. Yeah, so even though you loved your job, are you happier now? Are you, it sounds debatable. <laughs> it's just different. I mean, um, Obviously, part of going to a job every day is you see people every day and you have, you have mates at work you kind of joke with and so on. And of course, I don't have that now because my workplace is my living room. Um, so I kind of miss that uh, and I, I miss being a full time journalist. But I, mean, I still do things as a freelancer and so on. And, and my life isn't just writing fiction, there's other things I do around it. Um, it's, just, it's just different. And I think because it's only been three or four months, it'll take me a while to get used to it. Mm, absolutely. And in fact, in my first year um, as a you know full time uh, author entrepreneur, I actually ended up going to a library. I go to a library to write now because I need the commute and I need other people and I need to have, meet people for lunch and stuff. <laughs> no, I tried to like, kind of travel and do things. So I was in America for a little while and um, uh, just go and see things that I hadn't done. I, mean, I enjoy traveling anyway now. Mm kind of afford to go to places and so on, which I couldn't do before. And it's it's nice that you don't have to structure everything around your job. So if something's going on or and so on, you, you don't have to defer to what your work schedule is. You can just do stuff. So, um, I mean, that's a nice difference and so on. It's not, it's not a problem. It's just different not having to go to the office every day. Yeah, no, fantastic. Okay, so where can people find you and your books online? Uh, pretty much everywhere. I mean, Amazon's an obvious starting point because of uh, Kindle and so on. But I mean, they're, they're everywhere. They're on any ebook site you want to look at. I'm on there. And if you want to buy the paperbacks, again, they're pretty much everywhere. You can look for books, or if you're in the UK, or at your local supermarket or your local bookshop, they're just everywhere. You get pictures from like airports in Malaysia and Dubai and Australia and, and so on. And um, I mean, I suppose that is a the, one of the biggest differences with self-publishing to actual publishing is that the publishers do get you everywhere. Um, and so, so, like, one of my friends will go travelling somewhere and I'll send me a picture from the airport and say, I cannot get away from you. It's such <laughs> so everywhere, basically. That's fantastic. And your website? Uh, kerrywilkinson.com, K-E-R-R-Y, wilkinson.com. Fantastic. Thanks for your time, Kerry. That was great. No worries.